Hey guys, welcome to the very first video of our Organic Gardening Basics series. It's gonna be a series that's gonna run every Saturday in February. So today's the first one. Now this is not gonna be a short video. So grab a cup of coffee, cup of tea. If you're nervous about gardening, maybe something a little stronger. Not too strong though, cause you gotta pay attention. So grab a notebook and let's learn. So I'm actually gonna also add a fifth video once the series is complete. And that is gonna be to answer any questions that you guys thought of during the first four videos. So if you have a question at any time, go down to the comments section, write your question in, and I'm gonna make sure to answer as many as possible, either in person, through the comments, or on the fifth video of the series. Now, if you learned something from this video, please give the video a thumbs up it really helps. Also, if you're not subscribed, subscribe. And hit the bell notification so you always get notified whenever our videos come out. In today's video, we're gonna be covering the different types of soil that there are, helping you find out which one you have, and if there are problems innate with that type of soil, I'm gonna let you know how to fix it. We're also gonna be discussing soil pH right alongside that. We're gonna go over watering basics, fertilizing basics, pest and disease control, and uh, weed control. So we've got a jam-packed episode, so let's get right into it. So when it comes to soil type, there are four types of soil. And you kind of need to know what kind of soil you have so you know what the benefits of that type are and what the drawbacks are and how you need to address those drawbacks. So the first type of soil I want to talk about is sandy soil. Now, sandy soil is very gritty between your fingers. If it's damp and you, you squeeze it into a ball and let go of your fist, it's just gonna fall apart, just like at the beach. Water and nutrients drain right through. It's also a very hungry type of soil, meaning it eats up humus very quickly. Um, we lived at the beach for a few years and had very sandy soil, as you might guess. And there was like no amount of organic matter you could put in there <laughs> that wasn't gone by the end of the season. But that is one way to address the problem of sandy soil, is adding a lot of organic material, compost, um, you know, well-rotted manure. All that kind of stuff is going to hold on to moisture and hold on to nutrients that would otherwise just go right through the soil and keep on going, way out of reach from your plant's roots. You also want to apply a thick mulch of organic matter every season. So if you're growing in the spring and summer, put it on, you know, about now. And if you are growing in the fall, like a fall garden, you want to put it on right before you plant or right after you plant around what you plant. Now, if that's not an option, or if it's just like almost pure sand, raised beds are an opportunity there to actually grow something. And then you also, you know, because nutrients do drain out very quickly, you want to use a slow release fertilizer and not necessarily a liquid fertilizer. The next type of soil is silt. Now, that's similar to sand, but the particles, individual particles, are smaller. They're a little more weathered, a little more round. When you rub it between your fingers, if it's wet, it feels kind of smooth and slippery, not gritty like sand does. It does hold more water than sand, and it will hold together in your hand, which means it will compact a little bit uh, when you walk on it if it's wet. It also holds on to humus and uh, nutrients better than sand does. Now, I've actually mentioned humus a couple of times in this episode, so I probably should explain what that is. Humus is the broken down um, remains of organic matter. So basically, when you have the perfect compost and it's that black, rich, sweet smelling black gold, that is humus. It's basically what plants need to survive. The soil particles, the silt, the sand, and a couple other words we're going to talk about, it's just kind of like that's what holds the roots and what holds the humus and nutrients together, but it doesn't really give life. Humus is the life of your soil. With humus, um, it's kind of the same as all soils. You want to add organic compost and mulch every year, 
and that's going to keep your soil really healthy. It's going to it's going to really maintain the balance of silt to make sure it's not as compactable as it otherwise would be, and it's going to hold on to all that moisture and nutrients even better. The next type of soil is clay. Now, the house I grew up in and learned to garden in was almost pure clay. You know, you if you hold clay, wet clay soil in your hand and you squeeze it together and then let it go, it stays in the shape of your fist. You can even see your wrinkles and you can even sometimes see some fingerprints. That's because it contains the smallest particles of all soil. I think it's like 0 0.002 millimeters in size, each particle, really small. And that's why you don't want to walk on wet clay soil. And it will actually not let you walk on it because it literally is so thick and sticky that it will pull your shoes right off. So you don't want to compact it. It's basically the same stuff used to make pottery. So how in the world could you possibly grow in that? Well, with the addition of organic matter or humus. In fact, if you add a good amount of organic matter to clay soils, it can actually be one of the most rewarding types of soils to grow in because it does hold on to moisture and nutrients. And it's got a special, um, thing about it where it actually the particles of clay are negatively charged and so it holds on to nutrients that are positively charged like calcium magnesium potassium i believe uh, a lot better because opposites attract so it keeps those in there available for plant roots now there's a couple things if you have like really heavy clay soil and even a lot of organic matter is not doing the trick because it can become waterlogged very easily you can install french drains or if you have really tough clay soil you can apply gypsum to uh, the surface and then dig it in and you know do it according to the package directions but that's going to help break up and keep those uh, clay particles from sticking together so much one thing about clay though is never work in it when it's really wet and never walk on it because you're going to end up with tile now the absolute best type of soil to have is loam. Loam is a mixture of sand, silt, and clay. And you can have a heavy loam, which has more clay, or you can have a light loam, which has more sand. Now a heavy loam can still compact pretty well. Um, so you, but no matter what, organic matter, organic matter is gonna help any soil for sure. But loam is, it holds on to moisture, it holds on to nutrients, it doesn't compact super bad. Um, it will, if it's heavier, it will compact a little if you walk on it when it's wet, but you shouldn't be walking in your beds anyway. But with loam, a great way to add organic matter is just through, you know, three inches of mulch at the beginning of the season. And then the worms will pull that down and break it down and pull it into the, uh, the soil itself. So loam's a great one if you're doing a no, no dig type of uh, gardening, which we'll get into next week as well. So now that you know your soil's type, you need to determine the pH of your soil. Now, why is the pH so important? The most important nutrients to your plants are nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. There's a lot of others, but those are really, really essential that you have in larger amounts. But some nutrients, including those, can get locked up in the soil if it is not the correct pH. The plant needs the proper pH for its variety to be able to pull those nutrients out of the soil. So think about it as if we were out in the middle of the ocean on a life raft, we're surrounded by water, and yet we're still gonna die of thirst because our bodies cannot, we can't drink and process salt water. So a plant can be surrounded by nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and not be able to take it up into the roots because it's the wrong pH of soil. So right here on the screen is the pH scale. It goes from acidity to alkaline. And most plants are gonna be best able to draw in nutrients when the soil is fairly neutral around six or seven. Now there are um, outliers to this, such as blueberries and cranberries that like a more acid soil. Uh, and then there are uh, plants like asparagus that like a more alkaline soil. But for the most part, other than those, you're going to want a fairly neutral soil pH of around 6 to 7. 
Now there are about, well, there's probably several ways, but three that I have done that will give you either a approximate or a very precise value of the pH of your soil. The most precise is to send soil samples from your garden off to a lab uh, and they will evaluate it and send you back the results. Now I've never done that and probably most home gardeners aren't gonna do that. So that leaves us with three other ways to test it ourselves. Now the first and probably least accurate method, but the most fun, is one Noah and I did last year. Um, I'll put a link to that down below, but so it involves two mason jars, and I'll put a little clip right here. Two mason jars, uh, some soil samples from your garden, water, vinegar, and baking soda. So in one of the samples, you pour in vinegar, and if you hear a fizzing, that means it's reacting with the opposite, and it's an alkaline soil because the vinegar is acid. Then in the other one, you put in baking soda, and if you hear fizzing, then it's obviously opposite, so the water is acid. Of course, at the end, we just had to have some fun and mix them together. Definitely a fun experiment for the kids. Um, but if you want a little more reliable method, there are two that I can let you know of that are fairly inexpensive, uh, under $15. One is, and then one is probably under $7. The first one is a pH meter. Now, generally it comes with pH and moisture. So we can use this in just a little bit for our moisture segment or watering segment. It's got two prongs that you stick into the soil a few inches deep and it's got the pH meter right here on the screen and it's gonna tell you, and there's digital ones as well, but they're a little more expensive. It's gonna tell you what the pH of your soil is and you want it between six and seven, right? The other one are these pH test strips. Um, this is a little more work because you need to get a cup of water, maybe a, around a cup, uh, and then some soil samples from your yard. And anytime you're taking soil samples, it's best to get a little bit from several areas uh, in your garden area just to get an overall average because there could be something in one spot, like maybe you dumped a bunch of coffee grounds there or sulfur or something, and it's going to change the pH just for that specific spot. So anyway, we've got some test strips right here, a bunch of test strips that are in here like kind of matches in a matchbook. So you're going to mix the soil sample into the water and then you're going to dip the test strip into that soil sample just for like five seconds, pull it out, kind of dry it off a little bit, and then you're going to hold it up to the color code and see which color your strip is. And then that color will show you what pH your soil is. If it doesn't change too much, that's a six. So that's what you really want. Uh, if it goes just a tiny bit green, that's a seven. Now, if it goes really green, blue or purple, that's bad. And if it goes really orange or red, then that's bad the other way. Not necessarily bad, but for for your vegetables, they're not gonna like it. If you have something other than six or seven, what do you do? So if you have a number greater than seven, that means your soil is alkaline and you need to add some acid. Now to do that, you can add soil sulfur or aluminum sulfate to the soil. Um, you wanna apply it according to package directions. Um, you can also use unbrewed coffee grounds but it takes a lot more of those than you probably have, uh, depending on your garden space. So it's more expensive and it's not quite as potent as the other two. Now, on the other hand, if your number is like five, four, three, two, one, you're going to need to, uh, that's an acid soil and you're gonna need to make it more alkaline. You can add wood ash from the fireplace or wood burning stove. Um, you can add lime to the soil, again, according to package directions. And again, with both sides, none of these uh, solutions are immediately effective. It takes some time to break down and process through the soil. So the best time I'd say overall to put it in is in the fall when you have all winter for it to work. But we aren't in fall right now. Well, in the Southern hemisphere, you're, you're coming there. But right now we up here are in spring. So 
you can still put it in, just know that it might not take fully all the way until maybe fall. But a little bit's better than nothing, especially if you have one of these issues. Also, none of these solutions last forever. It's best to test your soil every three to five years so you know if you need to uh, change it again one way or the other. Okay, I think we're done with pH. Have you learned anything yet? If you have, please give the video a thumbs up. I'd really appreciate it. So in addition to humus, plants need fertilizer. Now, fertilizer is anything chemical or synthetic that provides nutrients essential to plant growth. So what's the difference between organic and non-organic forms of fertilizer? Organic forms are basically made from anything that was alive, be it plant, animal, or mineral. And a chemical fertilizer or a synthetic fertilizer is made in a chemical plant. Now I have a video that I will link down below about why I don't use uh, miracle Grow or other types of chemical fertilizers. Now every fertilizer that you can get, either bag, bottle, or box, is gonna have three numbers on it. And that corresponds to three ingredients that, and it's that the number is their percentage by weight of that ingredient in the fertilizer. The first one is nitrogen, the next one is phosphorus, and the last one is potassium. So to help remember what all this means, just remember the saying, shoots, roots, and fruits. Shoots refers to nitrogen, the first number, which is uh, responsible for green leafy growth. Roots pertains to roots, and that is what the phosphorus works on, good root systems. Fruits, pertains to the third number, which is potassium, and that is what is mainly responsible for helping to build bigger, better flowers, fruits, and vegetables. Now that's totally oversimplified, but it's gonna give you the basic knowledge you need to understand what these numbers actually mean. So what are good numbers to look for? Well, something like miracle Grow, a synthetic fertilizer, is 24,816. So that first number, nitrogen, is very high. They're all very high. and it looks good, right? High number is gonna give my plant the, the boost that it needs, and it might. But a lot of times that is too much of one, of one nutrient at one time for the plant to be able to actually handle the growth that comes with that. So what that's gonna cause a lot of times is very weak, floppy, long stems. So it's kind of like that fable, the tortoise and the hare, slow and steady wins the race. An organic fertilizer, on the other hand, might have numbers of two, four, two. So a lot less than a synthetic fertilizer. However, what it will give you, in addition to those nutrients, are a ton of other nutrients, minerals, enzymes, even humus sometimes, and soil microorganisms. Plus, it actually feeds the soil. It feeds the microorganisms in the soil, whereas the synthetic fertilizers not only do they not add any of those things, but they actually start to break down and kill those things. I hope that gives you a good idea of what fertilizing is and what those numbers mean, because that's really important whenever you're looking at a fertilizer to know which number corresponds to which uh, type of growth that you want to see. There's also two types of fertilizer, which is mainly, which is granular or liquid. And I use both. I use a lot of granular when I get started because it adds uh, a lot of nutrients and all those things we just talked about, microorganisms and things, and things to the soil that are slow to break down. So they feed the plant throughout the season. Uh, but I also, throughout the season, add in liquid fertilizer, which you guys know I use Neptune's Harvest and I absolutely love it. And I know you guys love it too because I've heard from tons of you who bought it last year um, for the first time. I was able to get them to reinstate our discount. So the code is here on the, sp the screen. I'll link it down below. So when you go over there, you will get the discount and free shipping to the United States. But definitely take advantage of that because in my opinion, that is the best fertilizer I've used and I've used it for years and years and years. Um, I like the, uh, in terms of liquid, I really like the tomato and veg formula. And um, for planting, I use the kelp, it comes in a bag, it's a powder, and then the um, crab and lobster formula, which is also granular and it uh, feeds over a long period of time. 
So I will link all that down below with the discount code. So that's fertilizing in a nutshell. Let's go and talk about watering basics. Far and away, the most common question I get on this channel and from what I've heard from other channels is it's a popular question there as well. And that is how often or how much do I water fill in the blank type of plant? Now, other than a few outliers like watercress, water chestnuts, um, taro, plants are most often the same. They like a moist root run and even like to dry out between waterings. So whenever somebody asks me, how much do I water this? I just give them the finger. This one. What were you thinking? The finger test is the most reliable way to know if your plants need water. And it doesn't matter if you're growing in the ground, in raised beds, in containers, it always works. Unless plants were just watered, it is totally normal and totally okay for the surface of the ground to appear dry. That doesn't mean it's dry all the way through. In fact, it's probably not. And it definitely doesn't mean that they need water. You need to know what's going on two or three inches beneath the soil. And that's where the finger comes in. Stick your finger in two or three inches. If you feel moisture, do not water. If you don't, then you can water. It's really that simple. Now there's a second time to give your garden the finger. Sorry, it's just too easy. Depending how much peat is in the soil or forestry type products, and depending when the last time it was watered and how dry it is, your soil could be hydrophobic. And that means it actually repels water, not absorbs water. If your soil is hydrophobic, you're gonna need to water it and even when you water what you think is deeply, if it's hydrophobic, after watering, you're going to stick your finger in and you're going to see that it might have only soaked down an inch, maybe two. In that situation, water it again, a second time deeply, and then do the finger test again. By that time on that second soaking, it should have uh, soaked down where it needs to be. It's not too common that this is this happens. It really is only if you've got a lot of forestry products in your, uh, in your soil and you've gone a really long time and the soil was completely dried out. And you really want the water to go deep. If you only wet the top two inches of soil, which a lot of times when you put your thumb over the hose and do this, that's what's happening, uh, you are training the roots to stay shallow because the roots are gonna go where the water is. And so if the, the water is in the top two inches, that's where your roots are gonna be. But what happens when the hot sun comes out and bakes that top two inches of soil? Your plant's gonna wilt and probably die. However, if you water deep, then the roots are gonna go deep. And even when that sun comes out and bakes the top two inches, your plant might wilt because there are roots there, but it's not gonna die. Another thing about watering is how to water. Now, in your head, when you think of watering, do you see this? Or do you see this? If you saw the second one, that's exactly right. You wanna keep as much water off of the leaves as possible. Now I know I can hear you because I've heard it in the comments a million times. What about rain? Well, we can't control rain, but we can control how wet we make the leaves, the moisture that we add to the leaves. And the more moisture that's on the leaves for extended periods of time is going to invite more bacteria and illness to the plant. Now, since we're talking about bacteria, when you're watering from below, which is the correct way, you don't wanna be splashing the water from the soil up onto the plant. Um, you wanna water low and slow because most of your uh, pathogens and bacteria is they're living in the soil, the good ones and the bad ones. And when you splash the bad ones up onto the leaves, they make a home there and start to proliferate. And that's not a good thing. If you've been watching me for any length of time, you know that my preferred way of watering is drip irrigation. I, uh, over the past couple of years, have automated my entire property. Every single thing is on drips, even the containers. I used to spend hours watering every week. Hours, no exaggeration. You might be doing the same thing. And now I spend zero hours watering. Now, if you're worried about the cost, 
or you're worried about how difficult it is to set up, don't be. It's way more affordable than you think, and you're going to actually save money in the first year. It's also way easier to set up than you think. It's way easier to set up than I thought it was. And I have two videos on that that I will link down below that go through the process and explain it step by step. The reason I love drip irrigation is it delivers water exactly where it needs to be, the root zone. It doesn't even fan out on top. You'll notice under each drip emitter, you're just going to see a, a dime size wet spot. And you're going to think, well, man, that's not putting out much water at all. But what happens is underneath the soil, it goes down into a triangle. So you're going to see a very small amount up top. But as it goes down, it gets wider and it soaks that entire root zone. Another very common question is, when is the best time of day to water? Well, as long as it's not a plant emergency and it's wilting and in the throes of death, at, at that case, it needs to be watered right now. Any other time, the best time to water is in the early morning, preferably around sunrise. Another reason I have drip, because I'm not going to be out here at sunrise. But when you water at sunrise, it allows the water to move down through the soil without being evaporated by the heat of the sun. And it also prepares the plant for the rest of the day by wetting the soil before it gets hot and dry. Now on to the subject we all hate dealing with, and that is pests and diseases in the garden. Organic gardening doesn't mean just having to put up with whatever pests and diseases come our way because we can't use poisons to kill them. In fact, organic gardening actually over time creates less and less need for pest control because it allows an ecosystem to develop both above and below ground. And this ecosystem forms the circle of life, a balance that gives your plants a better chance of not being attacked by pests and disease, or if it is attacked, it can handle it. You know, every day out in the garden, I see little birds going through my raised beds, picking off the um, cabbage worms. I see ladybugs eating aphids. You're really just wanting to draw in the right type of uh, beneficial insects to take care of the problems that typically would be taken care of with a poison. That doesn't mean we're helpless to, again, deal with the ones that the uh, birds and ladybugs don't get. There are plenty of organic solutions to just about any type of pest that's out there. Now, I'm not going to go through every single type of pest because that would take forever. And there's some in your area that aren't in mine and there's some in my area that aren't in yours. I've got other videos on specific pests. So just go to YouTube search, type in next level gardening and mildew, pet next level gardening and squash bugs, whatever you want to find, you can find it that way. What I'm going to go through is some uh, broader solutions to many of the problems you're going to encounter. First, let's talk about prevention. And we already talked about one of the preventative measures um, in the watering uh, portion. And that is not to splash water from the soil to the leaves, bringing the bacteria from the soil to infect the leaves. Um, the, another way, to, so one way is with drip, right? We already talked about that. Another way is with a nice thick layer of mulch. That way, if rain or if you accidentally forget and spray the ground and it splashes up, you've got a protective barrier between last year's soil, where those bacteria are living, and your actual plant. I should have also covered mulching in the watering segment because it also keeps uh, the moisture in the ground. And then I'll cover it again in the weeding segment segment because sneak preview, it keeps the weeds down too. Now mulch can be almost anything. It can be um, wood shavings, it could be pine needles, it could be straw, grass clippings. One word about grass clippings though, even though it might be plentiful if you have a lawn, you don't want to use it if you have a lot of weeds in your lawn with, with seeds. And you also don't want to put only lawn clippings unless it's a really thin layer, maybe less than an inch. Because if you get more than that thickness wise, uh, the grass is going to turn into a, a, a water impenetrable mat that is not going to allow your soil to breathe and take in moisture. So that's the one thing with, uh, with grass. You can also put down a layer of cardboard uh, or newspaper underneath that layer of mulch to give added protection. While we're talking about mulch, especially if you live in a uh, humid or moist environment, you want to keep the material 
the mulch material away from the actual stem of the plant that's going down into the ground. Just about an inch or so, keep it back, uh, just to keep some airflow there, because if you don't, you might end up with stem rot, and that's something that you can't fix. It rots the stem through and the entire plant dies. Uh, something to consider. Another great way to prevent the spread of insect damage or um, bacterial damage is to just simply walk through your garden every day with a little pair of scissors or shears and just snip off any damaged or diseased or dead leaves. It keeps the garden looking tidy and it will also keep those things from spreading to other plants. Once you have them trimmed off though, don't just leave them on the soil because they're gonna just, the things on them, the bad things on them, are just gonna migrate back to your plant. So make sure those are all thrown uh, in the compost, if not too diseased, or in maybe a, a yard waste recycling can. And that's really the problem with pests and disease. It doesn't just appear like magic all of a sudden. It's usually something that's been hanging out in the soil, or under uh, a leaf of your plant, and it just spreads, just like illness in humans, person to person. Now, another way of, of stopping that spread is through crop rotation every single year. A lot of pests and diseases are fond to one particular type of vegetable, right? And so if you grow the same vegetable year after year in the same spot, colonies of these problematic pests or diseases are going to now start developing in that area. And so it's going to be a perfect feast for them if you plant tomatoes the same place you planted them the last three years while those have been developing. They're like, oh, tomatoes again, awesome. And so crop rotation is just the practice of moving the types of fruits and vegetables you grow around every year so they don't uh, have a chance to build up a colony of that one type of pest in that spot. So typically you would divide your plants into uh, categories and that would be brassicas, which is broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, and kohlrabi. Nightshades, which are um, tomatoes, peppers, potatoes, and eggplant. Cucurbits like squash, melons, cucumbers, uh, legumes like beans and peas, and then you've got your root crops like beets uh, and carrots and rutabagas and parsnips. And so if you take each one of those types of those groupings, and let's say you're lucky and you have five spaces to put the five different categories of vegetables, then every year you would just move them around to the next one so that every five years, brassicas would come back to the same spot. In the meantime, in those five years, the brassicas from six years ago would be dead. I'm hoping that's making sense. You don't have to be fanatical about it, um, especially if you don't have five separate locations. Just be mindful, maybe keep notes of where uh, brassicas were this year and don't plant them there for a couple more years. Now, in raised beds, or if you're doing no-dig gardening, um, I do not rotate my crops. And I, th and I don't have a problem uh, with those lingering pests and diseases. And I think the reason is because every spring and every fall, I add a two to three inch layer of new soil and compost on top. And so that buries the previous uh, season's issues underneath. And so by the time uh, tomatoes go from one year to the next year, there's been you know, five or six inches of new soil put on top. Um, Charles Dowding, who really has made No Dig popular, he's in England, and don't quote me on this, but I'm almost positive that he said he doesn't rotate his crops either. And we'll be talking about No Dig gardening next week. Um, all this to say, a healthy plant, so if you have done everything we've talked about and it's in good soil and you fertilize and you water properly, uh, a healthy plant is going to fight off disease much better than an unhealthy plant. In fact, there could be, you know, a plant right here in the raised bed, maybe a broccoli plant like this, uh, and it could be sitting next to a broccoli plant right out here in the ground or maybe in a container right next to each other. And if one of them is being better taken care of right next to each other, the bugs are going to go to the unhealthy one every time.
because it's just a weak uh, target. So those are the prevention strategies. Now, if you still have problems with pests and disease, and you will, sorry, but you will, I'll let you know how to deal with them. Now, I, to simplify things in my mind, I always think of pests in three categories. That is animals, creepy crawlies, and worm type creatures. Worm types are the easiest to deal with, and that's tomato horn worms, that's uh, cabbage worms. The types of things you'll see, you know what they look like, right? They go through and they'll, you'll see big holes in your leaves or maybe stripped uh, leaves. You'll just see the stem sitting there with no leaf on it. They're, they're, they're easy to see their damage, right? Or their poop, but they're not easy to find. They're very, they're masters at camouflage. One of the things you can do is look for the damage and the poop and then inspect the plant, usually underneath the leaves. That's where you're going to find them, especially in the daytime, uh, those bright green cabbage worms, and just pick them off and destroy them in whichever way you see fit, not throwing them over into your neighbor's yard. You can also look for tiny little eggs. You'll see them on the underside of leaves where the butterfly or the moth has laid those eggs. Just kind of smear them off with your finger and that'll take care of the next uh, generation. Now, tomato worms in particular are masters of disguise. I mean, they are exactly the color of a tomato plant, right? Um, so they're really hard to find. But I have a trick and you're going to thank me. Get yourself a black light flashlight. I'll link it down below and go out at night. Flip that flashlight on and tomato worms glow under ultraviolet light. So the plants are gonna remain dull and you're gonna see those purple worms or bright green worms, just like a light on your plants and you can pick them all off and get rid of them. Another way to deal with worm type pests is to enlist an army to do the work for you. And I'm talking about parasitic wasps. They, uh, they sound scary. They're gonna sound even scarier when I tell you how they work. But what they do, they're, they're almost microscopic. They're not harmful to humans. They don't sting, but they come on a card just like this. And you can't see that, but it's the eggs of the wasp. And you hang it in the garden when you see uh, worm eggs developing on the undersides of your leaves. And they're going to hatch out and they're going to come and they're going to lay their own eggs inside the worm egg. And that baby wasp larva is going to eat the baby caterpillar larva and basically disrupt the whole life cycle right there. These are very inexpensive too. I'll leave a link down below. Now, if you want to go for a good old fashioned spray that is organic and safe for humans, pets, fish, and really only kills worm type creatures. Now it will kill beneficial butterfly worms as well. So, so maybe don't spray it on certain plants like uh, milkweed or dill or fennel because that's where the, the really good butterflies that we like, now they're still going to eat your plants, but not to the same extent as cabbage worms and tomato worms, right? So you're going to use a, a spray called BT. This is actually the real name right here, and it is scientifically proven that nobody can say that name, and that's why we call it BT. But BT works just like magic. It only kills the caterpillars. It does not kill bees or ladybugs or any of those other things. It only kills the caterpillar, and it kills it within just a couple of hours. I mean, it will be completely clean of caterpillars once you use BT. And you can harvest and, and, and eat the, the plants right afterwards. Um, you know, wash them off, of course, but it's not going to be harmful at all. It's one of my favorite products in the garden. I'll link it down below. So when you have an outbreak of worms that is just too many to hand pick or you're too lazy, BT is going to work every time. Now on to the creepy crawlies. Just use neem oil. I'm serious. Neem oil is so effective on just about every creepy crawly. It also works on um, fungus and bacteria like powdery mildew and rust. It's amazing. It's my second best. The BT and the neem is going to get rid of most of everything that you've got that's killing your plants or eating your plants. And again, it's safe for humans, pets, uh, fish. Neem oil is actually um, 
the oil of the neem tree, and it kills very quickly uh, biting and sucking type of insects. And those are the ones doing the damage and, and hurting our plants, right? Beneficial insects bite and suck the bad bugs. That's okay. But any bug that bites a leaf, it's going to ingest the, uh, the, the neem oil and it will kill them. Now, one caveat we have to be careful of, I've been assured by two beekeepers that neem oil is safe for bees when used correctly. Used correctly means you don't want to spray a bee directly. So I spray mine, my neem oil, in the very early morning, right around sunrise, before the bees come out. No, I don't. I'm not up that early. So the second best time is in the evening after the bees have gone back to the hive. You also don't want to spray any flowers that are showing pollen for that day because bees do eat pollen and they take pollen back to the hive to feed to the larva. And so we don't want, want to do that. So stay away from spraying the flowers uh, and bees will be totally fine. Now you don't have to use Bt and neem oil regularly as a preventative. Can you? Yes, but it's not necessary. You know, take a daily walk through your garden. You should do that anyway, right? Just to relax you. So a cup of coffee in the morning or whatever, walk through your garden and just pay attention to what's going on. If you see damage or poop or anything like that, then's the time to bring out the sprays, but you don't have to do it as a preventative. Now I am planning on doing a video in the very near future where I am going to uh, target the most common types of pests show you on the screen what they look like, what their damage looks like, and then how to take care of them. So you'll have a really good knowledge when you see something, you're gonna know what it is and what to do about it. But for the basics, neem oil and BT are your go-tos. The last segment for today is weed control. Now, we've already talked about prevention in another segment by putting down a thick layer of mulch. That's gonna keep weeds away. Another way to prevent weeds is if you get them, pull them out before they go to seed and produce another batch. And for Pete's sake, don't blow dandelion fuzz. I'm probably the only dad that yells at their kid for blowing dandelion fuzz and probably ruining their childhood. But I'm serious. Dandelions are the worst. Unless you're growing them for food, which I don't because I can't stand them, but I know there's some of you out there you can buy dandelion seeds from Baker Creek, which totally blows my mind. But if they're in somewhere where you can control, fine, but dandelions in the lawn are coming up everywhere, and those are not easy to get rid of, and I'll go through why in just a minute. So for getting rid of weeds, just use Roundup. Don't do it. Don't do it. So I've tried a lot of homemade weed killers. You'll see a ton of them floating around on websites like Pinterest. Um, some of them don't work at all. Some of them, the weed will go brown and then in a week or so, it'll put right back out new leaves. So really you just burned it. I am trialing a couple of different recipes with um, essential oils that seem to be promising. So if they work, I'll do another video on that because that would be amazing if there was a totally organic weed killer that you could just spray. Unfortunately, as of right now, the only truly effective method is the old fashioned way. Hand pulling. Now this is gonna let you know what kind of gardener you are. If you love pulling weeds or you hate pulling weeds. I myself, I love pulling weeds. To me, it's therapeutic, it's almost meditative. I put in my earbuds, put on some good music, and before you know it, the weeds are gone. I just wake up and everything's done. Maybe I'm weird, but I got very little weeds. In fact, I had to look for this spot right here to show you some. Am I the only one? Or do you like weeding too? Now, before you start hand pulling, you can't just go through and pull them out indiscriminately. There's two types of weeds and they need to be handled in two different ways. First are annual weeds. A lot of the grasses like this, bluegrass, crabgrass, buttonweed, lamb's quarters, those are all annual weeds, which means they got there from seed, dropped either 
two weeks ago or a year ago or whenever, but they're going to come up from seed and then live and then die after they set seed again. So pull them before they do. Those are pretty easy, especially in damp soil, to pull out. The difficult ones are the perennial weeds. Those are like kukui grass, oxalis, um, dandelion, dichondra. Those are growing from roots either that have been there for years or just grew from seed last year, but the roots stayed in the ground over the winter. And those are difficult because you have to get every piece of the root out because any piece you leave is going to grow another plant. So my favorite way to do that, let's say with a dandelion, dandelions have long tap roots, so you got to get deep. So either use a shovel or a trowel. I actually use a long-handled old uh, flathead screwdriver, and I can go around and loosen up the soil. And once I feel that the plant's loose, I can pull the entire root out of the soil, and it's not going to come back. Whichever types of weeds you're pulling, it's always best to water the area about an hour before you start doing the work. And that's going to loosen up the soil, and um, but yet it's not going to be like boggy. Now, if you've got a new uh, area for a garden that's covered in invasive weeds like crabgrass, uh, you can use, they have big rolls of black plastic that you can get at Home Depot or whatever, and you can roll those out over the area you want to plant in, weight them down, and if it's in the summertime, you leave them there for two to three months. If it's in the wintertime, you leave them there for about six months, all winter. And the heat and the sun is going to kill the weeds and the roots and everything under there. So when you take that plastic off, put down two or three inches of uh, a good compost, you can plant right in there and the weeds will be dead. Okay, I think that's enough for today. If you're still with me after all this time, let me know down in the comments what your favorite thing was that you learned. Definitely give the video a like. Make sure you're subscribed if you haven't already. Next week, we're going to be covering, let me get my notes here. Next week, we're going to, it's next Saturday. Um, in addition to no-till or no-dig gardening, we're going to be covering growing zones and climate, first and last frost date, garden placement, types of beds, in-ground versus raised, container gardening, and growing mediums. And in tomorrow's video, I'm really excited about this one because we're going to be talking about things you can plant or sow in the month of February. And it might surprise you. Even if you've got freezing weather outside right now, it's still time to plant. So I'll go through all of those. I'll, grow, I'll go through another um, download that I've got free for you on my website. It's not there yet, but it will be tomorrow. And it's going to be a worksheet that no matter where you live and whatever you're planting, you're going to know the exact time to start sowing the seeds and plant them outside in your climate. So I'm excited to introduce that to you guys. So have a great rest of your weekend. I'll see you tomorrow.